our next speaker, yeah, there is another diamond coming up. Uh, our next speaker is Naomi Halas. She is something different. She is a Kavli Prize Nanoscience Committee member. That means that she gets to nominate the Kavli Prize laureates. That is a very powerful position. There's a lot of money here in this prize as well, you know. The committee's work is sick. Thank you, and have a good time with the king, yeah. The committee's work is secret for now, and it's not relieved for 50 years has passed. So that's a, some work for historians to, to dig into in a, in a while. Naomi, she is a professor at Rice University in the US. She has so many positions, I can't name them all. It's She's a professor in chemistry, physics, astronomy, but then she has decided to work with nanometer. One nanometer, I am reminding myself and all of you, is one billionth of a meter, which is the scale that Naomi is working in, and this is both very small and very complex. So what got you interest in this very small? Nanometer, Naomi. Oh, well, my interests have to do with um, interacting with light. And what's so exciting about the nanometer scale is nanoparticles are smaller than a wavelength of light. So they interact with light differently than, say, lenses and mirrors and what we think of as conventional optics. It's a whole new way of doing optics. But you can, it also means you can do different things with light than you can with macroscopic objects. Please, Naomi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for... <laughs> so it's been a real pleasure working with um, the Kavli Foundation for selecting uh, laureates. And I want to bring you back down to earth because we're going to talk about nanoscience. and. Um, there are people, as we heard already from Huda and, 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 and Connie, there are people who really look into nature and they're very interested in discovery. Or, in the case of Huda, looking at the, the, the tragedy of disease and thinking, I must find a cure. And that's so very exciting. There's also a bunch of us who like to take things apart. You know, when we were kids, right, take everything apart. So my mother always complained. I was always taking things apart to see how they worked and then everything she picked up was like fall apart. You know, so, there, so that kind of curiosity, not just taking things apart, but also putting things together in new ways, creating things. I think it's fair to say that in science, we're creating things all the time. We call it invention, right? We're inventing new things, sometimes new tools to probe the universe, right? Sometimes things that are more practical. And many times, people create things and they don't know what they're for. Right? And it might take years for people to figure out. A great example is the laser. Right? It took them 25 years to find the, uh, that, that you could actually take a laser, you could actually use a laser for storing data. Right? So, and, and one of the most practical uses of, of, of lasers to date. But it took 25 years. So <clears throat> what I'm going to talk to you about are some things that I've been working on that are not, uh, that, that are, that are in the, there, there are ways in which we use nanoparticles, and in particular, there are the ways we use metallic nanoparticles. I'll start with gold, for example. <clears throat> and this is, a, this is the stained glass window from the Chartres Cathedral in France, and um, the beautiful red color that you see is actually uh, gold nanoparticles. So part of the charm, part of the wonder of, the na of, of, of nanometer scale science is the fact that when you take gold and you shrink it down to the nanoscale, it no longer looks gold. It looks very different. It looks green. It absorbs green light, and therefore you see the complementary color. You see red. So this beautiful red color called ruby glass is actually gold nanoparticles. And the ancient Romans learned how to make it. They didn't understand any chemistry. They were all alchemists. But it wasn't until modern science, so this is Michael Faraday. Many of you know of, of Michael Faraday for his, uh, his contributions to light and to chemistry and to electricity and magnetism understanding. <clears throat> he was also a great public speaker, and he learned how to make gold nanoparticles. And that beaker down there is actually, it's in London. 
in a London museum, and he made that back in the 19th century. It still looks exactly like the way he made it, but he would take this to all his public speeches and he would, and he would show this to people. So the thing that's amazing about metallic nanoparticles is how light interacts with them. It's very, very intense, and it's at specific wavelengths, just like, as I just said, gold absorbs green light. So for a nanoparticle that is, so for a wavelength of light different than what the particle absorbs, light passes right through. But when light, it correspond, the wavelength of light corresponds to a wavelength that that nanoparticle absorbs, that that metallic nanoparticle absorbs, what happens? All the electrons begin to move in motion with the light wave. So that optical frequency, very, very fast, the, 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 the nanoparticle electrons couple to the light. And look what it does to the light. It bends the light around far away from the particle. Right? So the particle has a, 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 has a diameter this big, but far, far away, several dimensions away. Right? The, the, it will affect light rays. So they're literally particles, nanoparticles, metallic nanoparticles act like nano lenses in a way they capture light. Another phrase we like to use it, optical frequency antennas. So they're like, we think we see big cell phone antennas, but actually for optics, you can actually, a nanoparticle acts just the way a cell phone antenna does, but for wavelengths of light. <clears throat> Another cool thing that they do, that nanoparticles do, is, well, the, this is a case where the, a gold nanoparticle captures green light, but if I take that gold nanoparticle that's a sphere and I stretch it or I change its shape in certain ways, I can, I can make that particle absorb light at other wavelengths. In fact, I can control the wavelength that it absorbs. So I can, I can actually do theory first and, and calculate what size and what shape I want the nanoparticle to be to absorb specific wavelengths of light, and then I can go into the lab and make it. So it's a wonderful, so you have sort of this full design principle, and then once you actually made it, you can study it and you can discover new properties that you never could have in originally intended for this. And that's why, so, so sort of the, the, the origin for us thinking about science and discovery as just a starting point. Because what's so wonderful, if you discover something or if you invent something new, is to actually take that invention and figure out how can it actually impact the real world. Just as we heard the mission of the Kavli Foundation is for the betterment of the world. So this is the idea. How do I get something that might be discovered in a laboratory out of the laboratory, the whole way out, and have it impact people, have it impact society? Well, I'm going to tell you two stories today about this. And first, I will tell you just in general what happens is crazy things happen. Because first, what happens is this idea that comes out of your laboratory, it often changes, it morphs, and sometimes you need new ideas to be added to it or new technologies. And I'll give you some examples of that. <clears throat> so in addition to sort of new collaborators and people who have different ideas and maybe even new fields, uh, impacting your invention, you also have people who think about business because nothing really succeeds as we know. We need money, right? And for anything to be, to, to make it into the real world and into society, it has to become some sort of commercial product. So, or at least in the, nano, the nanoscience world. So, um, so, so the combination of those things are what you need to actually finally get something to, uh, to, to, to use, to society. So I'm gonna tell you two stories. And uh, two stories of things that come, came out of my lab. One that started 20 years ago, and a little bit more than 20 years ago, uh, and that is uh, drug-free cancer therapy using gold nanoparticles. And the other one has to do with climate change, something we worry about all the time. And of course, you've heard about the hydrogen economy, and people say it's the economy of the future. It's very, very far away. It's not. So we'll tell you a little bit about that, too. So first, I'm going to explain to you what we did a long time ago, and just also to tell you how much uh, we've seen wonderful, heard wonderful examples, both from Huda and Connie, about how science, no matter what the field of science, it, it is a very social thing that we do. When we're isolated in the laboratory, that's one thing, but how we connect up to other people is really, really critical to everything we do. And so the person I'll start with is Jennifer West. She and I <clears throat> work together. She's a bioengineer, 
And very early on in my career, as I began to get interested in metal nanoparticles, in gold nanoparticles, I began to realize well, this very interesting principle I told you. If I change the shape, I can design the nanoparticle to absorb a color of light that I choose, within reason, right? The color of light that I choose. <clears throat> and very early on, I realized if I make the particle basically hollow, or a silica, silica core in a gold shell, if I make that structure, I can actually tune the wavelength of light out of the, away from wavelengths of light that we can see, but just to the red, just to the red of what we can see. And um, that's called the, the near infrared. And it's a very, very important uh, region of wavelengths because that is light that passes without absorption through water. Well, why is that important? Well, because we're big bags of water. And so it passes through blood. Blood is transparent, tissue is transparent, and, it, and, and, and it's, we can use this for biomedical applications. And so we have this crazy idea, which literally happened within the first 10 minutes of the first time that Jennifer and I met each other, and that was if we inject na our nanoparticles, if we inject my nanoparticles into, say, the tail vein of a mouse, this mouse has a tumor, okay? You can see the tumor at day zero, that's the day of treatment. If we inject it in, into the tail vein of the mouse and the particles circulate around, and then they will, it's just because of the way that blood vessels in a tumor grow, they will dump out into the tumor, so the nanoparticles will collect at the tumor site. And now I can take a laser source that has that special wavelength that the nanoparticles absorb, I can shine it right through the skin, it goes right through the skin, and the particles will absorb the light. They'll convert the light to heat, and they will photothermally uh, ablate just the, can just the tumor, just the cancer cells, very, very close to where the nanoparticles are. <clears throat> so you can see by, day, by, by about two weeks, the, um, the tumor's gone. We did an experiment with mice. Actually, we treated all the mice survived, and so you know, that's not supposed to happen in a cancer experiment. Mice are actually supposed to die but you expect them to die. So this created a financial catastrophe because we had to house and feed all these mice that survived to the end of their, of their lifetime, which of course was wonderful, which meant that we immediately started a company, and the company had to do lots of toxicity tests because that was always a big issue with, with, with nanoparticles, whether or not they're toxic, and the company eventually moved the work from animals into humans. We started with cancer. The question is, what so what cancer should we use? Big question, because it was, it's, so, it's really, really general. And then we began to focus on prostate cancer. <clears throat> so I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But let me first tell you a little bit about prostate, prostate cancer. Do you, oh, oh, well, stop. So, so the diagnosis, I'm not gonna, do, do people know what the prostate gland is? So men have prostate gland, it's about and a half centimeters in diameter. It is near, near the bladder and near the, uh, and near the rectum. So it's in a very high, high value real estate part of the human body. And, and so you don't want this, if, there, if there's cancer, that really creates havoc in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of bodily function. So it's very dangerous. It's also a very, very common cancer among men, one in nine men will be diagnosed with cancer, with prostate cancer during their lifetime. It's very common. If you have cancer in your family, the diagnosis is one in three. So it's something that all adult men must be very careful about as you're, you're young adults, so it's something that you can certainly, you need to be aware of that throughout your life. <clears throat> so let me explain to you a little bit about sort of the, the current form of treatment. So before 2012, so the reason I'm showing you this is because they did this, the, 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 they being clinicians, because I'm not a medical doctor, I invented the nanoparticles, right? <clears throat> so, uh, so, so before 2012, when you took an image of the prostate, this is what you saw. You'd see a gland, right? That's an ultrasound image, okay? You don't see anything inside. You know there's cancer there because there's an elevated level of PSA, called prostate-specific antigen. So people know that there's cancer there, and so if you do a biopsy, you're just sort of guessing. You're just sort of going blind, putting ne needles randomly into this gland. <clears throat> and so that, that was very, very imprecise. But then there was a technological breakthrough. So in 2012, People figured out a completely different field, nothing to do with nanoscience, had to do with image processing. So people who would do MRI would take those images and fuse those images with ultrasound, and all of a sudden you could see beautifully tremendous detail inside of the prostate gland. 
And so this was so successful, it was a revolution in terms of cancer diagnosis for the prostate. And so very, very quickly, uh, companies like Philips and Siemens that make MRI machines, they began to use that new technology so that people could very precisely diagnose, uh, right, so they put the, the biopsy needle in only where the suspect tissue is, so they could precisely see this. So, um, <clears throat> so, so this was a revolution, and um, it's called fusion-guided biopsy, and the fellow who invented it it turns out was also a doctor, also a urologist. When he was very young, he worked on this as a medical researcher. And <clears throat> so, um, so, so, so this is Art Rustenhut, another fellow who was actually my neighbor, works at the same, um, actually the, uh, works at the hospital right next to the hospital where Huda works. Stephen Canfield, he knew about our nanoparticles and he knew about this wonderful new way of diagnosing uh, cancer. And he said, instead of putting in a needle, what if you put in, what if you infuse the prostate with nanoparticles, with, with, with her nanoshells, and then if you put in an optical fiber, then you could actually destroy just the tumor in the prostate at the very, very early stage so it wouldn't cause damage. And so this was his idea. So the idea is to take that mouse study that I showed you and just scale the whole thing up, scale the concentration up to be, to, to be enough for a human, and then do exactly that treatment. So the company des decided to do this. So the company's called Nanospectrum Biosciences, and so they call the, the treatment the particles aura shells. They call it aura lace therapy. And so this was the first line of defense. So if there are other treat, you can do other treatments afterwards if you need to, but this could actually stop things very early on. So um, this is actually what this looks like. So using the same platform, that's a human being. So this is a person in the cl clinical trial of which there were about 125 people. I'll say more about that in a moment. <clears throat> but the platform that they use for positioning the biopsy needle is exactly what they use for positioning light once the prostate is, is infused with nanoparticles. <clears throat> so you can see how precise this has to be, right? So there's just a millimeters between in, 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 in this area in order to get a very, very accurate positioning for, uh, for, for, the, um, for, for the optical probe and the nanoparticles without damage. So. <clears throat> Now you're going to hear a little bit from Stephen Canfield and his... The side effects of treatment are well known. Uh, a man may be afraid of becoming impotent or becoming incontinent at a young age and therefore never seek treatment, never seek screening, and present with the cancer too late. And so I'm working for all of my patients who, who know uh, there are better things on the horizon and better treatments coming. Well, it started. I guess about two, two, two and a half years ago, came and saw Dr. Canfield and, and he said, well, you know, it's this kind of tumor. It's sort of one of those that's sort of serious. It isn't serious. And he laid out all the options of the different kinds of things that could happen. And suddenly his face changed and he had this twinkle in his eye and he said, but you know, there's one other thing that you could try. And then he informed me of his treatment with the gold nanoparticles. And so the nanoparticles absorb a color of light that passes uh, very easily through the human body. So if they're placed in a tumor, or if they collect in the tumor naturally, if you shine light on that tumor, the light will pass through the tissue and will be absorbed by the nanoparticles. They convert the light to heat and they locally ablate just the cells very, very close to the nanoparticles themselves. The technology is innovative because it's, it's unique. We, we are putting an inert nanoshell in the human body, uh, taking advantage of natural tumor biology to, to localize the shell at the tumor site, and then lighting it up with laser energy to create you know, cell death. For types of cancer, like prostate cancer, that require a very ultra-localized approach. This approach is absolutely ideal. It is so non-invasive to the patient that it's really, it's really game-changing. Patients may feel guilty sometimes. I've had patients tell me, I feel guilty that I got to do this when I know so many men who weren't able to participate in this trial or had never heard of it. As far as I was concerned, it was, it was excellent. It was a matter of simply all outpatient care, no complications, no pain, no discomfort. And at the end of it, you know, a year went by and my PSA is back to normal, my MRI is basically normal, and uh, at the present time I'm cured. To date, the clinical trial has been very successful. The goals of the trial being treatment of prostate cancer in a focal and localized manner with 
minimal to no side effects, at least not the standard ones of urinary control or sexual function, uh, have all proven to be true. The technology works, so it's all very encouraging, and I do see a pathway in the future that this will be a commonly used procedure. I am so happy to see this wonderful treatment now being uh, pursued so successfully and really changing men's lives for the better. Any man who is offered the chance to have a focal treatment to get rid of his cancer rather than a radical treatment of his prostate and with all of the side effects that come with that jumps at the chance. In fact, anybody who's been a candidate for this trial has not turned down the opportunity to participate. And that's because it is so compelling. It sounds too good to be true, but it really does work. The University of Texas is an incredibly supportive environment, allowing us to do our work with patients, but also innovative research like this. So you can guess that film was actually made by the urologists. That was made by the people at the University of Texas. So they're very proud of themselves. But it's really, um, it's, it's very exciting actually to see the case study. And in fact, my father was a prostate cancer survivor, so I know very, very well how, uh, how, this is, how important this is. And we're very excited because all the patients have been treated in the clinical trials, and we're just waiting. We're less than 60 days away from taking the 12-month data, which means that, that, that then we can go to the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and we can get this approved for a much more widespread treatment. So that wraps up story number one. Story number two is totally different. Because after all, I make nanoparticles and light, so I can apply them anywhere. Depends who I collaborate with. And so this is a story about climate change. I'm sure you're very well aware of energy, and you might not be aware of is how we spend energy or who spends energy. And in industry, the biggest bad boy is the chemical industry. And we rely on the chemical industry for all of modern life, right? All the materials that we use, the fabric in our clothes, right? The so many different things. Um, but they consume an amazing amount of energy. This big chemical plant is down the road from, from, from Houston, Texas. And um, what's very interesting is to see how much energy they use every day. And it's all fossil fuels for two reasons. One reason is hydrocarbons are used to make plastics and polyester, all these things of modern life. But also, they do all of their chemistry at very high temperatures and very high pressures. So they need a huge amount of fossil fuel to fuel the actual reactors. And of course, because it's not very efficient, they have to build really big ones so they can take advantage of economy of scale. So they really, really need this. So it's very, the energy equivalent of 850,000 barrels of oil per day, more than the total daily oil consumption of Australia. Do you know what the total daily oil consumption of Norway is? It's about, it's, a, it's around 250,000. So it's less than Australia, right? So think about this. So this, <laughs> so this one chemical plant is using several times more uh, energy every day than your country. So something's got to change. If we need to deal with climate, we need to deal, we need to address, and we can't do it incrementally. We have to come up with completely new ways to deal with this extraordinary energy consumption that we rely on for modern life. <clears throat> so this is the story, right? This is the, you know, the, this is a typical chemical reactor. Feedstock in is hydrocarbons, but fossil fuel consumption, right? Hydrocarbons drive these very, very high temperatures and, uh, that are neat, and, uh, and of course it produces CO2 like you cannot believe, right? So for all of our interest in decarbonization, this is where we need to set our, uh, set our sights on. <clears throat> so why don't we do chemistry in a completely different way? Why don't we use light instead of heat? And so, so this, is, this is our vision for, um, for, for what, we've, what we've done, what we've done in our laboratory. And let me tell you more about what one can actually do. So <clears throat> if you take, so this is what this looks like. Right? I told you about gold nanoparticles earlier. So we can also, not only can we heat up tumors uh, with gold nanoparticles, we can also do chemistry on the surfaces of gold nanoparticles using light. And this is a very simple chemical reaction. So you don't have to know any chemistry. 
Um, but basically, this, what we're going to do is we're going to dissociate H2, hydrogen molecule, and we're going to split hydrogen. Okay, it's a very stable molecule. You have to put in a lot of energy. So if you were to do it thermally, you'd have to do it at very high temperatures. <clears throat> but let me show you what happens. Now, we're going to shrink ourselves down to the nanoscales, and we're going to look at those are the gold atoms on the surface, and this is my hydrogen molecule. And so what happens is we can flow this over a gold surface, and it'll only weakly associate, but if I shine light on the nanoparticle, then I can transfer that, 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 that excitation of the, of the nanoparticle itself will generate a hot elect, what's called a hot electron, an electron with energy, which then transfers to the molecule. H2 becomes H2 minus. It has Coulomb repulsion. We know about char like charges repel, right? Opposite charges attract, like charges repel. And this lowers the barrier. The molecule now wants to dissociate because it's got that extra negative charge. So I can very easily, at room temperature, I can cause this molecule to dissociate. So this is really beautiful, but there's a problem. We all know about gold. Gold is gold and gold stays gold, right? It doesn't interact with many things. We, gold doesn't rust. It actually does oxidize, but really, really slowly, right? You have a gold, people have gold jewelry. It looks gold for, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it looks gold for a very long period of time. So all of these metals, they're called the coinage metals, gold, silver, copper, not aluminum. That's another thing. I, we do a lot of things with aluminum, <clears throat> but they, and it also has these great optical properties that I showed you, but they are really don't, they don't really interact very well with uh, chemicals, with molecules. Now, talk to a chemical engineer, and they'll say, these are the, the, these are the elements that you're going to do chemistry with. But they don't even interact with light. So how can we do this? How can we get the both, best of both worlds? How can we capture light, but then also do chemistry? We have to figure out a way to combine our optical antennas with our reactive molecule. And so, so we did this. So I have a picture of Peter Nordlander, who is my collaborator. He's a theoretician. He doesn't have a laboratory, he has a computer. But he had the idea, why don't you build something like this, an antenna, and then put little reactor islands on it? And so, yeah, that's a great idea. So we went in the lab and we built it. So we call it an antenna. We, we, this is a, a, a schematic of it here. We use an aluminum antenna for specific reasons. And then we put little islands on the outside. And it worked beautifully. And we published a paper and we wrote a patent. And we were very excited about it. Then, and then, Peter and I got an email. Each of us got an email from these two jokers. Okay. These, are young, these were young engineers. They were, at a, they were actually at a, um, at, at, a, at, at, at a petroleum company. They were petroleum engineers or chemical engineers. <coughs> and uh, they said, but they were young and hungry, and they wanted to start their own company. And they saw the paper, and they're like, we want to commercialize that. We want to bring that to market. That's so exciting. <coughs> so. Quite frankly, I, I deleted the email. Peter didn't delete the email, so he met with them. And then about 10 minutes into the meeting, he calls me up and he says, these guys are for real. They are amazing. So then all of a sudden, we, so of course, we met with them. They started a company uh, with, our, with our help. And that is, that is our story. And this is the beginning of, this is their vision. Oh, no. Is an essential yeah. part of go. the world that we live in. It is used to produce many of the products that we use every day, <laughs> like gasoline, plastic, and glass. It can also be used to generate clean energy and provide a sustainable future for our planet. Syzygy Plasmonics has developed a revolutionary new way to produce hydrogen. We are developing a first-of-its-kind chemical reactor. This reactor allows us to produce chemicals such as hydrogen at a lower cost and with fewer carbon emissions than is possible today. Our reactor contains a new type of material that was developed at Rice University. This catalyst material represents a revolutionary breakthrough for science. It is a highly specialized photocatalyst and it allows us to perform chemical reactions with light. This means that we do not have to burn fuel, which helps us to reduce emissions. And we can use simple materials like glass and plastic, which helps to reduce cost. Using this technology, CCG has developed a small-scale distributed hydrogen-producing system that dramatically reduces the cost of hydrogen for our customers. Perhaps the most interesting of these customers are hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. When we bring our first product to market, it will be capable of producing hydrogen fuel at a price point so low it can compete with gasoline. For every semi-truck, forklift, or passenger vehicle, 
that we enable to switch from gasoline to hydrogen, it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by several tons per year. By making low-cost green hydrogen, we are helping the world take a strong step in the right direction. The hydrogen industry needs a novel technology to help it reach its true potential. Syzygy Plasmonics is here to provide that pioneering new technology. So that's the name of the company, Syzygy Plasmonics, and their vision is hydrogen. And uh, so what do they do? So here are actually some, some things out of our lab. I'm not going to, there will be no quiz. I'm just going to tell you what, what, what we're talking about here. One, one reaction that we showed that you can do with light is decompose ammonia. Why do we care? Because it turns out that ammonia is the best way to store hydrogen. Right? Ammonia is NH3. If you can figure out a way to easily and it, with, with very low cost release the hydrogen, then you can have trucks of ammonia or ships filled with ammonia, and you can use that as fuel. Of course, the reason we want hydrogen as fuel is that when you burn hydrogen, you mix it with oxygen, you just make water. So carbon is completely out of the picture. It is the ultimate, it is the ultimate green fuel. However, it costs four times, more than four times, what gasoline costs. And that's the problem, is how can we make cheap hydrogen, which is why Syzygy is focused on making cheap hydrogen. <laughs> the other reaction, so don't worry about chemical equation, don't faint if you see chemical equation, <clears throat> is something called methane reforming. So this chemical equation here, you take methane and you, so this is what, how 90% of all hydrogen on the planet is made. It, it, it is a very, very energy, uh, en energy hungry reaction. It's a, it, 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 is a, it, it, it requires very, very high temperatures under thermal conditions. Uh, but this is, this, is what the, this is the industry standard. And so what we found in our work is that we can also, we can do methane re but we can do it with light at hundreds of degrees below what does, is done in industry. In fact, when we run this reaction, so I'm not gonna explain the data, but you can see in the box, we have no external heat source. We only use solid state lighting to run this reaction. <clears throat> and so this is, you know, this is what the state of, of the art today. High, high temperatures means very expensive steel for, for the reactor. And if we go to light, solid state lighting for a reactor, then uh, much, much, le uh, much, much lower temperatures, of course, using light means you can electrify the entire process. And then you can use very, very inexpensive equipment, as we, as we saw on the, uh, on, on the video, which were the first five employees. So that was the entire company was those first five employees. Now they're up to 65 employees in just a few years. And what they've done is develop a light-based reactor. So this is this, so, so the, the catalyst sits inside, the uh, chemicals flow inside, and what surrounds it are, is a bank of solid-state lighting. So the solid-state lighting that is a, it, the LEDs that are the revolution that we know of in, in all sorts of other uh, applications, also they can now do chemistry. So, Let's see how they work. Syzygy's photocatalyst is a nanoparticle system that is made up of two parts. It is composed of a larger light harvesting plasmonic nanoparticle, which is covered with much smaller catalyst nanoparticles. Photons are made using high efficiency LEDs, and these photons interact with the plasmonic nanoparticle produce plasmons, which in turn energize the catalyst nanoparticles. This interaction causes the catalyst to generate high energy electrons that are able to make or break chemical bonds. Inside of Syzygy's reactor, this basic process of using photons to perform chemical reactions happens more than one trillion times per second. Ultimately, this is how our chemical reactors work. So what, since 2018, which is when they first called us up on the phone, uh, is, is take our little tiny reactor that we have in the laboratory and make it bigger and bigger and bigger and make it for, for industry, going from expensive lasers that we might use in the laboratory to solid, banks of solid state lighting. And they know how important this is and how revolutionary it is. Every time 
prototype and then they move to a bigger prototype, they actually save it and they keep it in their own little museum. So they're building a museum as they develop these, uh, th these reactors. So now they can make kilograms every day for one of these reactors. And they have, so they've, they, they've scaled the process up by half a million in just a very a few short years. And they're away from an actual commercial product, which will, which, so how crazy this is, what a coincidence. They call it Rigel. Rigel is the name of a star. So Rigel is, a, is the blue giant star in the constellation Orion. And because they use blue light in the reactor, and it's big, so they call it after, uh, after one of our common stars. So they're moving from kilograms to tons of hydrogen a day, and the price is going further and further down. And so they are very, very close to, uh, they are very, they're very close to actually having a commercial product. It will happen next year. And they also have lowered the price down to what ultimately, sorry, this is in dollars, but everyone here can convert. Um, but they're, they're, they're trying to approach the final, the, the real destination, which is $1 a kilogram for hydrogen, which will make hydrogen very viable for, uh, for, for all sorts of fuel cell vehicles, uh, like trucks and so on. And they've gone from five employees, and then they, they, they had 30 employees, and now they have a big, big building, and they have uh, room for 100. They have 65 employees, now they have room for 100. And this is where they're doing their final scale up. And two weeks ago, they just signed a major agreement where they're actually going to be doing this in Korea. So they will be decarbonizing Korea. So they signed this with two large chemical companies in both in Korea and in Japan who are very, very interested in Asia. They're extremely interested in moving as fast as they can to a hydrogen economy because they do not have fossil fuels uh, in, in those countries. So I've walked you through a couple stories. I've, this is Art Rostenhan, and he's actually standing next to patient number one, Martin Feeney, and Martin Feeney's wife and showed you a little bit about uh, how we can take some other innovations from our laboratory and combine na designing particles that combine nanoparticles with light and start to do things that we really need for also for, for saving our planet. So with that, I wanna, I'm more than happy to ask, answer questions. I just want to showcase some of the wonderful people that are in my, in my laboratory. I've had more than 50 people in my laboratory, 50 PhDs uh, since, my, since, since I started at Rice. And I'm just so, um, I'm so privileged to be able to work with so many other really smart, energetic people. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's very nice that your co-writer on that paper didn't delete the email as you did. Yes. Yeah, so that's really <laughs> a, a wonderful story and so inspiring. Thank you. And who will be, yeah, question makers. One gentleman back there and one, one here later. And women, you are challenged. And there's no thing as a silly question, right? There you go. Thank uh, you. Hi, my name is Ralph, and uh, I was wondering with the source of the light, would it have been possible with, uh, to use solar energy also? Great question, and people talk about that. but. So, so, solar is wonderful, it's cheap, but it's also, it's also relatively uh, difficult to work with solar for a couple reasons, okay? One of them is night, <laughs> right? You want to be able to actually control your light source, and so the problem of energy storage, this is a big, big problem with people. The intermittency of solar is a, big, is a big issue. That's why we haven't switched over, more of us haven't switched over to solar, because it is not, it, we don't have really good storage, you know, that's, that's, that's really kind of at the level that you could have for a community, for example. Um, so, so that's one issue with solar. The other issue is the wonderful, we have, I mean, it's broadband. Right? And specifically for chemistry, you really want just a narrow wi window of wavelengths. And so it, it fits solid state lighting perfectly. What's wonderful about solid state lighting is that people have been making LEDs more and more and more efficient. 
So if you buy a string of Christmas tree lights, those are very inefficient. Right? They're, they're, they're made very, very inexpensively, but it's not that hard to actually engineer uh, LEDs to be at s above 75% efficiency. You can actually get up to 90% like efficiency. And so one of the aspects of the technology that Syzygy developed was really how to push the efficiency very, very high for, uh, for the LEDs that they use. And the, and the LED companies, the commercial companies that make these sorts of lights are very excited about this because they never had any idea that there would be this whole new application for, for LEDs. Thank you for and the question. Another, yeah, another question here. Thank you. How are you able to actually make these nano machine, no machines, but nano materials? Chemistry. <laughs> so you can reduce, you, so, so you, you reduce salts. So this is sort of, so, so, so the alchemists back in the ancient times, what they were always trying to do was they were trying to make gold, right? They wanted to convert lead to gold. And you know they could never do that, but what they did learn was how to dissolve gold. So they learned how to take certain acids and you, go, you can take gold, for example, and you can dissolve it and make a salt, okay? And all the metals can, are, can be made in the form of salts. And so most of the nanoparticle chemistry is basically taking those salts as your starting point and then learning how to convert them back to metal but in controlled ways so you can control the shape. And you do this with different types of molecules in many cases. So, for example, the Kavli Prize this year on self-assembled model layers, people use those types of molecules that are used for, that, that, that came out of that wonderful discovery. They use those types of molecules to shape nanoparticles into the, the, the shape that they want. And isn't it right there were like 10,000 patents from those so, monolayers? Yes and, yeah. uh, yes, and people haven't even talked that much about how important those monolayers are for making nanoparticles, but they actually, that's one application that's very important that we just, ran, people just ran out of how many, t how many uses there are for, for self-assembled monolayers, but that's a very important one. Do you have one, one more question there? And one in the back, yeah? But first, this gentleman with the blue shirt. Hi, uh, my name is Brage, and I was wondering, uh, could this nanoparticle technology be used for more complex uh, molecules, for synthesizing them? Great, great question. Um, yes, but we're sort of going little by little. We're sort of using simple gas phase molecules. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, yes, yes, but we're, this is the baby steps of reactions. I mean, we'd love to at some point go from gas phase to liquid phase and do more complex molecules. Uh, we talk to organic chemists who are very interested in how one can use these for, for, for doing more complex reactions. But we're, you know, we're not there yet. We've done about maybe 25 different reactions, um, but we're starting small. Also, can I ask another question as well? Yes. Um, the tumors, could it be used for other tumors, uh, not just prostate? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So um, this, uh, this was, I think, the, one of the problems with the company was because very early on, we, had n we, we couldn't really figure out like, what was the cancer this would be best for. And what, and, uh, but of course you're also, in the world of cancer, there's many different types of drugs, right? There's many different types of treatments. And so to make this commercially viable, you really have to look for a niche where there really is an unsolved problem. And there are other niches besides prost prostate cancer is, of course, you can be, have treatment by radiation, and then if it's very advanced chemotherapy, but that induces all of these really horrendous side effects. And my, my father lived through them. Uh, so, uh, so, so the ultra-localized approach is what really has, the, the people have keyed in on. But then there's other ultra-localized cancers. One of them is retinal cancer. Another one is thyroid cancer. Cer certain individuals who, cannot, who, need, who have thyroid cancer and cannot be treated by conventional uh, chemotherapy, for example. So, um, so, so there, are, there, there are many important cancers that really are left unsolved because, because of, of a, a lack of this kind of very high-precision treatment. Also, 
do the nanoparticles, <laughs> do the nanoparticles uh, remain in the body after treatment? And yes, everyone asks me that question. So they leave the body slowly. They don't seem to do any harm. So there were many, many, many studies that show they leave through the liver because they're larger. So, so here's a, a, nano, a nanoscale rule of thumb. Anything smaller than 50 nanometers will leave through the kidney. Anything larger than 50 nanometers will leave through the liver. So they leave over the, uh, over the course of months, but they seem to cause absolutely no harm in liver function. So there are many, many studies that have been done, and of course now there's a human population and we see no, absolutely no effect uh, of, of doses. So this is actually very, it's very promising. It's different than the way drugs are. Drugs clear the body very quickly, and then we have problems with drugs in our water supply, right? But, but here the nanoparticles leave more slowly, but they don't seem to, to, seem to cause any toxic trail on their way out of the body. Good. We have a last question up there, I believe, yeah. I was wondering about the first story. Um, how do you, how do these uh, nano uh, particles go into the body? Uh, in what way, and uh, how are they kind of programmed, or how do they get to the prostate, for example? Great question. So. Tumors have a certain property. So, so the thing we know about cancer cells compared to normal cells is that they grow much faster, right? And they have a faster metabolism. And when the cancer cells begin to grow into a tumor, they grow their own blood vessels, right? And the tumor, of course, is very different from normal tissue. It grows blood vessels to feed that very, very rapid growth. But then the blood vessels that it grows are not very well put together. They're sloppy. They have dead ends. They have holes. And so the typical, what's called the tumor vasculature, okay? So the tumor blood vessels are leaky. And it's that leaky property that actually allows one to deliver drugs too, but to deliver uh, nanoparticles into the tumor site. So people have known about this idea of the leaky vasculature of tumors for decades. This is how chemotherapy drugs work also. So any particles, because very often people will deliver, so some drugs are made such that they are drugs in a little liposome, or which is a little nanoparticle, made this, that's, that's basically a membrane surrounding a drug that's about 100 nanometers in diameter. So commercial drugs are, 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 are formulated that way. And so they also can be deposited into the leaky vasculature. So we knew that about that, that, that pathology of cancer. And so instead, we're delivering a benign nanoparticle the same way you would deliver a chemotherapy drug. Lovely. Thank you so much, Naomi. Sure. I think it's time for us to make an end of this uh, emerging talent session. And thank you, thank you so, let's give a hand to Naomi, yeah.